Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to send every single dupe through the temporal tear. See, what had happened was Carol and Allison had returned from their long flight over from Frazola, and the news quickly spread throughout the colony about the magical temporal tear. Except when Allison and Carol were describing the temporal tear, they said it looked like neon cotton candy. And it just so happens that Lindsay Grossman loves neon cotton candy. And Eric W. said, there's no way you're leaving me out of the neon cotton candy either. So pretty soon there was a sign up sheet and everybody has elected to go. And I don't have the heart to tell the duplicates that no, it is not neon cotton candy awaiting for you in the middle of the star map. But then again, I'm not an expert in astrophysics, so who am I to say? And everything was copacetic until Naz got on the phone with the good dupes over on Frostland and told them about the neon cotton candy. Union reps were called, and long story short, Miko and the gang over here said there's no way they're missing out either. And you know what happens with the rumor mill, it wasn't too long until the ESS Long Looksee and Saintly Gator had heard about the neon cotton candy out in the middle of the star map. So Saintly Gator is hauling tail all the way back to the home colony so that they too do not miss the magical adventures in neon cotton candy land. And sending everybody through the temporal tear will not be a violation of work safety protocols. Quite simply because there'll be no one left to make the report. The dupes over in Frostland had a problem though. Unfortunately, you can only send one duplicate at a time through the teleporter transmitter. And then you have to wait another five cycles. So that's a total of 20 cycles and these dupes were not about to pull straws to see who was gonna miss the taxi to Neon Cotton Candyland. Once again, the venerable Dupe Workers Union has gotten involved and is sending Allison over to pick up all the dupes to bring them back home so that they can catch the taxi. While Allison goes and picks up the dupe like some sort of interstellar Uber, let's go ahead and start on the business of building our monument. I had already removed the third rocket platform from this area here and that way we'd have plenty of room for a beautiful monument. We also have plenty of materials, but something tells me the cost has gone up. Seven and a half tons of steel just for the bottom? That seems a little ridiculous. Now, because just the base itself has over 10 tons of worth of material, it can take the duplicates a little bit of time to be able to drop everything off, especially considering where we're building this thing. It's actually one of the after actions about this colony that I did not like and will make sure I take into account next time I have a late game colony. This area here where our rockets are is really far away for the duplicates. Remember, the dupes on this colony can only enter the space biome through this wonderful little spaceport. And while I like it, and it's everything you'd want in a spaceport and more, it's also on the very far left side of the map. So for instance, one thing that we've always had a problem with is dropping off oxalite. Whenever a rocket sends out the air and it says, hey, our oxidizer tanks need some oxalite, the duplicates gotta come all the way here from the middle of our base, cross over to the left side of the map, go all the way up, and then go all the way over. Half the time the duplicates get the errand, they end up dropping the oxalite somewhere because, well, it's either time for lunch, it's time to go to the bathroom, etc, etc. And if we weren't squeezed in for so much space, a nice transit tube system would have worked out really well here. You may also have noticed that here it is three quarters through the cycle and our battery is still at 15 kilojoules, which is a little bit better than the power grid has been doing as of late. And here was the culprit. This represents 3,400 watts. Well, just about. These steam turbines range from 850 watts and on the weakest go down to about 630 watts. Well, I was down here doing some work when I realized these thermo sensors were flipped to below which was causing the doors to stay open instead of closing whenever this area here needed more heat to drive these steam turbines. While I wouldn't put it past me to flip those like that, the fact that both of them were flipped makes me question the fact that it could have been that sensor bug every once in a while that causes the settings to change. Of course, it could have easily been me too. Who knows what Echo was thinking at like cycle 1400. Maybe this area was too hot and I decided to cool it down for a little bit and then just forgot. Squirrel. John Mann is finishing up the bottom of the monument base 
which means it's time for our monument midsection. And we are missing something. It's got to be the ceramic, right? We use an awful lot of ceramic on this planetoid. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Give me a few minutes to make some more ceramic. Frostalin's Uber has arrived safely. They just need to build some ladders. With the ladders complete, it's time to crew everybody up. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Nobody wants to miss out on the magical trip to Neon Cotton Candy Land. Everybody loaded up? Okay. Goodbye, Frostalin. You were such a great colony. Its major export was beautiful sleetweed and bristle blossom. And it was responsible for all the beautiful berry sludge that we use here on our home colony. It was also the source of life for our home colony in the form of polluted water being provided by this cool slush geyser. Because remember, this colony didn't come with any water. Because, you know, echo things. There we go. That's how you crank up a little bit of ceramic production. The midsection will be going in shortly after we drop off two and a half tons of ceramic, two and a half tons of plastic, and five tons of steel. The ESS Long look -see and Saintly Gator have returned, and they have come bearing gifts. Looks like we have the egg-shaped rock, another office mug, and the shield generator. Now, as this rocket is being retrofitted to transport all the dupes to Neon Cotton Candy Land, they also demand a name change. Ladies and gentlemen, the fluffy unicorn bunny. Don't blame me, blame Dave Hammer. It was their idea. Our midsection is now complete, and it's time for the head. Apparently the ladder we put in for the midsection is also good enough for the top part because they seem to be able to reach and we'll shortly be dropping off another five tons of steel, two and a half tons of glass and two and a half tons of diamond. Another nice update that happened over on our petroleum boiler is we switched it over to be using a thermo aqua tuner, except we did it a little bit differently than we'd ever done it before. You'll notice this thermo aqua tuner is in a vacuum, and yet it's sharing temperature with these metal tiles. The way the automation works, whenever the thermo sensor says it needs some heat, it shuts this door and turns on this thermo aqua tuner. And as you can see, the thermo aqua tuner itself is up over 430 degrees, as is the metal tile. This is all thanks to the wonderful new conduction panel. The conduction panel can be found in your plumbing pane, even though you don't have to run any liquids or anything through it. Basically, one side of the conduction panel is touching the metal tiles, the other side is touching the thermo aqua tuner. So as long as this thermo aqua tuner is getting hot, it shares the heat with the metal tiles, which then shares with the mechanized airlock whenever it shuts, which then heats up the boilerplate. So far, this has been running for 20 or 30 cycles and is working perfectly. The coolant loop on the thermo aqua tuner is just a heat dump where we have super coolant going around and exchanging temperature with a pool of super coolant. Because it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're not going to end up freezing super coolant. But the system works pretty well. It only gets as high as about 450, which is plenty of heat transferring into the metal tile, causing the boilerplate to rise just enough in temperature to keep all the crude oil flashing into petroleum. Ah, the wonders of thermium. John Mann is finishing up our monument, which of course means that we've reached the home sweet home imperative. Now I'm gonna let this thing play, but here's the spoiler warning. Spoiler warning. If you've never made it this far, you're gonna wanna fast forward about 30 seconds. And that's it. Pretty anticlimactic, if I would say so myself. But now let's outfit this monument a little bit better. Ooh, we could go with Plug Slug Head. That seems mildly appropriate. What happened to poor Harold? I think as standard, we're gonna go with the Rover. We really do miss Rover. Here's another gentle reminder, Clay. Please give us the ability to charge Rover. And being able to make the rest of the monument into Rover would be nice too. You know, if beggars can be choosers. Well, there it is. There's our wonderful monument. Now we're just waiting for the rest of the dupes to return from Frostalin, and we can load up this party bus. I suppose it's time to load everybody up, but considering there's not enough suits, we're gonna have to disable the Atmos suit checkpoint, which shouldn't be a big deal as long as none of the dupes decide they want to ranch some critters before they go into the rocket. As for our crew, we need to just select everybody. Now, Saintly Gator was a little bit upset that they were using the ESS Long look -see because after all, Saintly Gator had gotten attached to it. But it didn't take too long <laughs> as they were scraping that title off and writing the fluffy unicorn bunny on the side of the hole where Saintly Gator just gave up. 
Now, there was also some hemming and hawing because Queen Calero wanted to bring their cuddle pip. But unfortunately, because not everybody was allowed to bring their own quitter, the union voted that Queen Calero would not be able to bring their cuddle pip. But it didn't take too long for the overwhelming glee to kick in that everybody was soon heading for the neon cotton candy land. And with 23 adorable duplicate faces all smashed to look outside the window, the unicorn fluffy bunny finally leaves Eugenia. Now being this colony was with us for several months worth of episodes and almost 1900 cycles, I think it's fitting to go over some of the stats on how this colony ended up. Our first major project was the ethanol distillery into the petroleum generator. If I were to do this differently, I would have made sure that each petroleum generator was in its own power plant so we could have used the NG tune-up on every single generator. That would have definitely made this a little bit better. It took quite a few tries before we figured out a rail rotation and bringing enough lumber through it in order to keep everything cool, but one potential way you could have done it is put the petroleum generators all on top and have the polluted water that's dripping down be responsible for cooling everything off. And in this way, it would have been even easier to put the power control station in here and just had one giant room with petroleum generators. Yes, we would have had to put some Atmos suits and everything in because it is entirely too hot up here, but that would have been 50% more power out of the petroleum generators for the life of this colony. And it would have came in handy because this colony had eight thermo aqua tuners. These two, which could have been combined, our latest addition was being used to generate heat for the boiler plate for our petroleum boiler. This thermo aqua tuner was being used to keep these steam turbines cool, which these steam turbines were responsible for our geothermal power. We had one thermo aqua tuner here that was responsible for keeping all of our oxygen cool. And then we had three thermo aqua tuners inside of our industrial sauna. One was responsible for keeping the steam turbines cool for both the industrial sauna and this gold volcano here. The other two were responsible for doing the cooling out of a pair of debris chillers. All said and done, some of the material stats, thanks to those six metal volcanoes, we ended up with 308 tons worth of cobalt, almost 100 tons worth of copper, and 115 tons worth of gold. And that's despite the fact that we're feeding 16 plug slugs with nothing but refined metal as well. Our molecular forge did a great job, and although you can't see it because there's no duplicates to be able to get inside the industrial sauna, just right here is almost 75 tons worth of super coolant. We also have almost 28 tons worth of thermium, and we still had plenty of fullerene, niobium, and isoresin. Now this entire colony thrives and survives off of polluted dirt and sand. Because we didn't have any water source on this planetoid, very early on, we realized that we're going to need an alternate source of oxygen because of that lack of water. So we used all the polluted dirt being created out of the ethanol distilleries and fed it to sublimation stations. And after cleaning all that polluted oxygen, we're left behind with clay. We then take the clay and the coal, we create ceramic, and then we smash the ceramic to create more sand to keep all the deodorizers going. And after about a thousand to fifteen hundred cycles of messing with it, we finally ended up with five beautiful gas pipes full of oxygen. Speaking of which, let's go over some of these overlays. Here's our beautiful gas overlay. One cool feature in the gas overlay is the use of carbon dioxide in keeping the arbor trees at their appropriate temps. Whenever it got too cold over here, the valves would switch on and send the carbon dioxide right past the trees, heating them back up. We also used oxygen as our coolant for our giant battery box. While they're definitely not very cool, at over 100 degrees, it's still a decent enough cooling apparatus in order to keep them from overheating. And we keep all that oxygen moving because it all ends up here in our spaceport, so every time this door opens, a little bit of oxygen goes out. Here's our wonderful plumbing overlay. Of note is the polluted water coming in from Frostalin, which is not only being used to keep all the mealwood chilled to keep the Drecos fed, but it's also keeping the thimble reed and the compost area chilled before finally being fed to a bunch of our domesticated arbor trees. Speaking of trees, here are the first 10. Here's another nine. Two of them are domesticated, seven are not. And here's a bunch more wild. And it's all that lumber 
that is driving all that ethanol creation. Also of note is the crude oil coming down from all the slicksters, going down the entire left side of the map before it ends up in a petroleum boiler, where it turns into petroleum, and then goes all the way back up the map, where it eventually ends up in our wonderful petroleum storage. And then there's the power overlay. This power spine, despite looking a little bit crazy, is my absolute favorite. The spine itself wraps the entire colony. All that heavy watt wire goes full circle, so no matter where we are in the colony, all we have to do is drop a large power transformer somewhere on the edge, and we could stretch power anywhere, and it wouldn't be too inconvenient of a run. As usual, nothing special about the automation overlay, other than the fact that we did put a bunch of pixel packs on the main transport corridors to improve the decor. Which brings up the decor overlay. Not too shabby. Because we decor bombed the industrial sauna, there was even some spots in here that weren't too bad for the duplicates. And then finally is the conveyor rails. This colony had more rail line than I think I'd ever put into a colony, and it was in an attempt to automate just about everything we could. Now over in our rocket, we seem to be having a disagreement as no one will let Eric eat any of the berry sludge. It says they are starving and they have unpermitted food. And for some reason, they didn't have a check mark next to berry sludge. So let's make sure that they can eat. Definitely wouldn't want to starve to death before we got to happy neon cotton candy land. Oh boy, this is awkward. You can imagine the duplicates' faces all peering out of the window and Lady Ruff doing the same thing going, Hey guys, where's everybody going? You see, Lady Ruff never got the message about magical neon cotton candy land. Because Lady Ruff didn't have a party line in their rocket. So unfortunately, they will not be going. Now, none of the dupes can seem to decide whose responsibility it was to check all the dupes' names off the lists. Nor can they decide whose fault it is that they didn't wait for Lady Ruff. Dorito B didn't care much, though, because they were heading towards cotton candy magic. More cotton candy for me, they thought. Look, everyone, you can see it out the window. Guys, are you sure that's Cotton Candy Land? As the dupes are about to enter this temporal tear, here's another spoiler warning. If you don't want to see what happens when the duplicates make it to Magical Neon Cotton Candy Land, you might want to skip ahead about 30 to 40 seconds. Spoiler alert, there's no cotton candy. And was it me or did that ship just break in half? Maybe all the duplicates got put into little escape pods and the cotton candy's on the other side. And it looks like all the rocket debris has chosen to land on Levito. I wasn't sure if it was going to end up going to Aquazon or Levito. I know one thing's for sure though. Lady Ruff is about to be very, very upset. Hey guys, I'm home. Huh, I wonder where everybody went. Oh well, more Frost Burgers for me. Well, that about does it for this episode and this series. I hope you had a great time with it and are looking forward to our next series that we've already started. Mini base. While we won't be accomplishing near as much in that playthrough, I'm sure there'll be plenty of antics. So until next time, I'll talk to you soon.